Here we go. Okay. We'll be live any second. We I'm are ready. live. You've got Mel with Pablo Solman. It's alive. <laughs> we're alive and we're kicking. Pablo, it's so great to see you. It's great to be seen. Thanks, Mel. Before we before we do the jingle, uh, we have to thank Yossi Vardy. Of course, who, uh, always. Who, uh, None of us would know anyone if it weren't for Yossi. <laughs> and uh, so in a minute, you'll, uh, you'll tell me how you know Yossi Vardy. And oh. first, we got to do the jingle. I, do you have All a jingle? Right. Um, uh, I do somewhere. Let's do yours first while I dig up mine. Okay. I, I, uh, I highly recommend jingles. Um, People love jingles. Here we go. You've got mail with Pablo Solman, and we start. Get a chill, grab a seat, or we'll sweep you off your feet. We move, we groove, you got mail. Ease your legs, rest a while, all you gotta do is smile. We're swell, can't you tell you got mail? When the show begins, you better hold on real tight. Or before you know it, you'll be high as a kite. Take a break, settle down, we're the only show in town. That's our road, don't you know you got mail? Give it up, don't think twice, we're a hurricane on ice. What the hell, give a yell, ring your bell, show and tell. Mademoiselle, give a smell, you got Mel. You've got Mel. And Mel has wow. Pablo's. Okay, you ready for my jingle? Um, yeah, I'm gonna, you, I have to give you the, uh, the possibility of sharing your screen. You have and to share I'll, a screen? Okay, let's try it. Yeah, I'm gonna do that right now. So I'm gonna make oh, okay. you co-host here i mean it's, it's just audio but we can try it ah, if it's just audio then i don't have to make you close but i so already try it see if you can yeah. hear it ready yeah go ahead Yeah, you know, <laughs> These jingles are kind of an illustration of who we are. Uh, so Pablo, who, who are you? <laughs> uh who am i i'm the, i'm like um i'm like the man behind the curtain i think that's that's where i that's probably where i'm at most of the time <laughs> behind the curtain that's also behind the curtain um mm. so so explain to our viewers how we know each other okay so how, how you met Vardi? okay we'll start with that because it is the origin of everything um <laughs> The big bang. I was, so back in almost, I, I think it was about 18, 19 years ago, 18 years ago, uh, O'Reilly had the first Foo Camp, which was a, the first, kind of like the first unconference ever. And they invited a bunch of, you know, interesting people to come camp at their office. And they have a really beautiful office they built in Sebastopol, but um they just had like a camp out at the office and we all like brought tents and camped there and um somehow i got invited and um a bunch of other you know o'reilly was you know is the technical book publisher and so they know a lot of interesting nerds and people who know a lot about weird stuff and so um i showed up there and you know when i go to an event i like to uh you know i like to make sure i have something to share so I had brought this robot I built called the HackerBot. And the robot could drive around, find people on Wi-Fi, and then steal their passwords and show them to them on, its, on the screen on the robot. So it would just like drive up to people and show them their own passwords. And it really freaked people out. And I think uh, if I remember right, Chris Anderson, who was the editor of Wired at the time, was there. And I stole his password. And um, and Yossi was there, and a bunch of you know a bunch of other sort of notorious tech nerds at the time. And Yossi, of course, with his world class sense of humor, thought it was the best thing ever. Even though it's like 
a nefarious robot that's stealing your passwords, people mostly thought it was cute. And Yossi thought it was amazing and he insisted uh, on the spot. Oh, actually, I think Danny saw it. I think Danny found it. I don't know. Danny was there too, Danny Barty. And um, I think maybe Danny saw it first and maybe show Yossi. And then anyway, Yossi insisted that I come immediately to Israel to Kinternet. And I, you know, I didn't know what Israel was. I didn't know what Kinternet was and know who Yossi was. And I politely declined. <laughs> And for the next year or two, Yossi, you know, stayed in touch with me and kept inviting me and, and insisted I come. And I said, man, that sounds amazing. But, you know, I didn't have time. I didn't have money. I didn't, you know, couldn't, couldn't go halfway around the world. And then one year he just called me and said, Pablos, you're coming. I already bought you a plane ticket. You fly in two days and he made me come. And I just, I got on the plane. I, I, I was groggy and jet lagged when I got there. I got into a hotel room and I looked out the window and I saw all this water. And I'm like, wow, it's a lot of water. It's too big to be a lake. I wonder, this is before Google Maps, you know, I wonder <laughs> where I am. <laughs> So I tried to figure it out and I'm like, oh, that's probably an ocean. And so I looked up and figured out where I was in the world because I didn't know Tel Aviv. I didn't know what Israel was. I really didn't know. And, um, and I figured out that was the Mediterranean Sea out there. Um, and, I, and I'm like, wow, this place is pretty great. And so then the next, so I was there for a day or two and then we went out to Kinternet and my whole life was changed forever. Yeah, and that's okay. probably, I'm sure I okay. met you that first year. Yeah. Okay, I'm not sure it was the first year, but um, because I also didn't come the first year. No, the first year that I went. And Yossi invited me. Uh, okay. I, the first year I came, I think, was 2007 or 2008. But Yossi mm -hmm. invited me. But mm. not being a computer nerd like you, mm. um, I actually asked a student of mine to explain to me what Web 2.0 was. So yeah. that when I, when I came, I wouldn't be a, a total, total moron. Okay. Um, oh, yeah. And of course, and Kinnerin had also changed my life. Uh, how, how, how did it change your life and how did it compare with O'Reilly's food camp? Because O'Reilly came to Kinnernet yeah. and he told me that Yossi's version was better than his, but you've been in both. Yeah, I have been to both. And I, I, um, I have to say, O'Reilly's camp at the beginning, I mean, you know, it was most very heavy on computer nerds. Um, and it was, you know, you know, unconference was new to us. So you had the big whiteboard with, you know, rooms and times or vice versa. And, you know, people would schedule talks, but it was a lot of, a lot of talks, you know, conversations and you drop in and hang out with people and have a conversation about something usually pretty tech oriented. And it was great to be able to have those kinds of deep conversations with people who were, I'd say at your level with technology and Silicon Valley is pretty, you know, at the time was a lot, uh, you could be surrounded by a lot of smart nerds, but this was the cream of the crop. And so it was really special. Um, what Yossi brought to it was a, his complete sense of pandemonium. And so Yossi's idea was not so computer nerd oriented or even or technology oriented. Yossi's idea was like um, mayhem. And so he invited, as far as I could tell, like all the most deranged Israelis there are. And that's saying something because, you know, any Israeli would qualify. And these guys showed up. I remember the first, I just like, it was just, it was like a 17 ring circus at Kinternet, I remember at the beginning constantly, I'm just like running around in circles trying to like figure out, I always felt like I was missing something cool somewhere else. And everything I was doing was cool. So I just was torn between, you know, do I hang out with the guys who installed an entire helicopter as a game controller for like a helicopter game? Or do I hang out with the guys who are like strapping a Jado rocket to a surfboard so they can like you know, go out on the Dead Sea in style. I like there's, or do I go follow the people with the flaming bicycle around? 
or, you know, and then, you know, it just, it escalates and everything about Kinternet. I mean, I'm sure that you're, you know, we have some Kinternet folks watching and, and reminiscing is fun for them, but for people who haven't been there, like they're probably sick of hearing about it because it's yeah. really like nothing else in the world. Um, and I learned so much from that. And I, um, I, I, you know, I'm not, obviously, since I didn't even know where Israel was, I'm not particularly Jewish as far as I know. And I don't even know, I didn't know what I was getting into. I had no idea such a place existed. And I got a deep appreciation for both the country and the people there. I made amazing friends. I'm friends with to this day, both from Israel and from other parts of the world that Yossi brought together and, and, and who you know, I've gotten to build relationships with over all that time. And, and, so, and, you, and you became a, uh, a Kinernet hero, not just because <laughs> of your uh, Michigan. Uh, do you know what Michigan is by now? Uh, I only know Shalosh. <laughs> Michigan is like, uh, is like crazy in a good way. Um, yeah. You know, your uh, laser killing mosquito invention. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> but also because you are a professional dancer. <laughs> Well, and, Sammy, I mean, yeah, there's that one ended up so being when, when, when the sun uh, goes down on Kinernik, you know, it's all Pablo's <laughs> dancing, uh, amazing salsa performances. Well, I'm a I'm an obsessed dancer and um, it turned out to be the kind of, you know, most tech conferences. That's not really not really an opportunity to sort of work it into the schedule, but at Kinernet you know, uh, somehow it was easy and, and I had a lot of fun dancing at Kinernet. So yeah, a lot of people know me from that um yeah it's a it's a pretty so, special so let's, 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 so let's say let's say hello to to your classic dancing partner debbie if she's watching <laughs> debbie and yeah she was debbie was always game to dance that was awesome yeah, yeah. And, your, and your explosive uh, partner in arms uh, dan dubno dan of course he's probably out there hi dan he will get you on this show next shalom oh he's been on this show Oh, he's been on the show already. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he did you one up yeah. on that, Pablo. So, hey, uh, Dan, Dan, well, Dan, I met independently of, of Kinternet, but yeah, we became good friends and, and ended up getting into some mayhem all over the planet after that. So you're a, you're a professional hacker, a professional dancer, a, a writer, an author, um, you're, you're a real polymath in the wonderful sense of the word. Uh, how did this all start? Tell me about your Pablos as a, as a baby and a little kid. Well, there's, I, I when, think, when, did yeah, you, the, when did you start ruining the world? <laughs> start ruining the world? Yeah. <laughs> I, um, so the, you know, we've talked about this some in the past. I grew up in Alaska, which you could think of as, you know, kind of the, opposite of everything but certainly like the opposite of israel in a lot of ways um but similar i think of it as i actually think of of it as having some analogous things about it so alaska um is sparsely populated i mean it's a lot of land with not a lot of people but um you know, with the exception of a, a small number of Native Americans, there were just very few other people, or Native Alaskans, I should say, very few other people in, the, at the, in that region at the time. When I was born, you know, there wasn't, you know, the population was maybe a little under 150,000 people. Did you and ever whole, ask anybody what you're doing there? Um, <laughs> Uh, nobody had an answer for that. Um, but what was, but, but the point I'm trying to make is everyone that was there in my life largely moved there from somewhere to get away from something or somebody. So in that sense, they were immigrants. It's a melting pot society. They were mostly American immigrants, but it still had that property of people who all came to a place having to figure out how to make it work having to figure out how to, you know, be pretty self-reliant. Um, it's kind of, it's not technically an island, but it's further than any island from civilization. So everything has to be shipped in or flown in. You, you know, I had to, to order something out, out of a catalog. I had to like fill out a postcard and put a stamp on it and lick a stamp and wait six to eight weeks for delivery, that kind of thing. Probably true in Israel. 
So I think there's a lot of analogous things like that. Um, and, and, and looking back, I think it was pretty unique and pretty special from what, what I can see compared to other places, at least in America. So what let's get those things. What was yeah. your family doing there? Where, what? Well, the truth is everybody, what they're doing is um, oil industry. And so you, you could be more direct or indirect about it, but that's the fundamental economic driver up there. And so, um, so my dad was in the oil industry and everybody else's dad, if, 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 if you, even if you were a school teacher, <laughs> indirectly, the oil industry paid your, your salary. And that's really the, the only um, real economic activity up there. And um, so, you know, in that sense, it's also kind of a, you know, kind of a conservative right wing society um, pro oil and those kinds of things. And so that gave me a much different perspective, I think, than I, than I tend to get now living on the West coast. <laughs> yeah. So, um, what was little Pablo's like? Um, you know, I got glasses when I was four years old and I think it had the, uh, the unintended consequence of making people think I was smart. And so I started uh, trying to rise to their expectations, and um, I'm still doing that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I. So yeah. For, but but the most you know this is, you know. Pro, for me, the most clear inflection point was the moment that I got my first computer, and it was 1979 or 80, and I got an Apple II. And um, that was pretty unusual in the world in those days, really unusual um, in Alaska. You were, you were probably the first person in Alaska to get the, an Apple II. Right, right. I was definitely one of the first, if not the first. And I know I wasn't the first, but I was pretty close because I had an Apple II Plus, which was before, it was the second model Apple made, but it was before the Apple IIe, which is the one that, you know, got big and they made, I don't know, millions of them and put them in schools and things. And, um, um, and so I got an early start with computers, but the, you know, but I, at that time it was rare for an adult to have a computer, much less a kid who was nine years old to have it all to himself. And if you're in Alaska, Nothing else is competing for your attention. <laughs> so I didn't have anything else I had to do other than try and play with this computer. And I, I learned a lot that way, the hard way, you know, and so it, it helped. I mean, it was, a, it was, a, I've said before, like, you know, I had the computer, the Apple II, and I had a skateboard. And people were pretty conflicted about which was a bigger waste of time because it, in those days, no one had seen a computer. They didn't know it was going to be a thing or going to be useful or anything like that. And, um, uh, but I could see it. I, I, I could feel it, you know, someday it would have more memory and someday it would be faster and someday it would be useful. And I, I was convinced of this and I, I became kind of evangelistic about it. You know, I tried to convince people the computer was going to be something. And, in some sense, that's what I'm still doing today. I'm trying to convince people <laughs> that, no, really, these computers are going to be amazing. They just need time. Someday, and someday. Someday. So um, I want to uh, fast forward, and then I want to fast backward. So okay. you've written about, um, and you've spoken about uh, human beings becoming pets to AI, AI robots. Right. <laughs> and I've written that we already are. Yeah, have happened for many years, and uh, I'm 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 a pet to this thing over here. You're an iPhone accessory. Yeah, this is my master. A few yes. words, please, on this. Yes. Well, look, I mean, I I think it's actually an important um, way to think about it, right? I think yeah, we must have had this conversation before because, you know, there are things like. Um, you know, this, the conversation around AI and about robots take it over and all that is really, in my mind, kind of off course. And one of the things I think is really important for people to acknowledge is that 
um, we're already cyborgs. Like you already, like when I was a kid, I, I had to memorize the phone numbers of my friends. And every day you would give your phone number to somebody and they would write it in their, you know, contacts to this kind of thing to keep track. And um, right now I know like one phone number, right? Or maybe I know mine. I don't even know my girlfriend's phone number. <laughs> I might not know my daughter's phone number, you know, and, but I got 10,000 phone numbers right here. Right. And I rely on that thing the way you rely on it. And every every night before I go to bed, I look at my calendar to see what time I got to be up to be on the next fucking Zoom call. <laughs> right. Every morning I look at my calendar to see like where what what Zoom call do I have to be on next? You know, who, but, who am I today? Yeah. And even before COVID, you know, I, I mean, I my number one app was TripIt because I travel a lot. So every day I just get up and look at TripIt to see where I'm supposed to be in the world, you know, and I. Um, so for a long time, we've already out, your brain learned quickly that it could outsource memorizing phone numbers to a device that was much better at it. So this is part of your brain now. And of course, it's been an extension of your other capabilities, your voice, you know, we're speaking halfway around the world in real time right now. And of course, that's not a feature that we had before. So we're cyborgs, whether we like it or not. And some people could be more or less, uh, you know, you could be more or less in, um, aggressive about embracing that and trying to discover what your potential is with the help. But, um, but that, you know, that's kind of each person's individual choice. But by and large, a lot of the things that, um, that we're doing to augment humans is, it is helping us. It's making us better. It's giving us the opportunity to do more of what we want with our lives instead of what we just have to do. And you could say, you know, things like the agricultural revolution did that for people. You know, you don't have to, I think for most of human history, people just had to work all the time. And now we've gotten so efficient at the fundamentals of food and shelter and, and, and keeping people from dying of diseases and things that you get a lot of free time. And I think we're at the beginning of evolving an immunity to the free time, right? And, I, and right now we wanna, you know, humans just wanna find somebody to blame. And so we're blaming Netflix and Instagram and Facebook and stuff. But the truth is it's our own fault because we succumbed to those things. And we decided that what we needed was more free time to watch Netflix and Instagram and Facebook and all those things. But the truth is most of us have way more free time than we need. And we're frustrated that we aren't accomplishing the things that we want. And we're not getting more of the things that really are rewarding. So, so um, Pablo, you're so, saying that this yeah. is our fault as individuals. Yeah, because, I do believe because, that. Okay, because I, as a biologist, mm -hmm. okay, which I was once, I will tell you, yeah. you know, human beings are, you know, they, they're suckers for food that has fat and sugar, sugar. and salt. Yeah, right. And, uh, and we're suckers yeah. for a lot of uh, um, things that marketing people know about, about us. That's right. And so we are sucked in yep. by Netflix and by, by the phone yeah. and by- They've by weaponized Netflix. your psyche against you. Exactly. So, so why, you know, you and I have yeah. met uh, senior people in the internet industry. Sure. Um, I don't know who your hero is, but my hero is Jimmy Wales, who oh. of, all of, the, all of the really people who changed the world, Yeah. Um, he did the thing that has the least advertising and the most yeah. benefit for yeah. free. Right. Yeah. Okay. So let's use that example, right? You, um, you know, you, you know, w Wikipedia, we love it. It's amazing. It's extraordinary. It's, we all thrive because of it. Right. I had to spend my childhood and yours memorizing names and dates and numbers of, I had to memorize, this capital of every state in the union, the names of all the presidents of America, Washington, Adams, Jackson, Van Buren, Harrison, I had to do them all. Why? My daughter doesn't need to waste her life memorizing that shit. She has Wikipedia in her pocket and she will for the rest of her life. So she can waste more of her time on Netflix. <laughs> okay, so 
What I think you know about what, it your is- Your daughter, one second, could waste more of her time. Yeah. You know, Wikipedia mm -hmm. has a, a function for people yeah. like us, which is called getting lost. Yeah. Finding out about the world. Yeah, right. Why I, mean, I, I have time. I don't, I don't watch things on Netflix. Right. I try to find more, more things that are- Right, but are, that's probably a skill you built because you grew up in a world without Netflix. So uh, like you and I had libraries and we had to put some effort into going and digging and getting lost and learning and seeing what we could discover and find. Yeah, and, and, I, I go on now oh, and I say there's all of this useless information. Like, mm -hmm. you, yeah. You, okay, you, you referred to having one of the first computers in Alaska. Mm -hmm. In the most, world. Yeah, this is, this, this is good for shit. You know, people are never going to use this. Um, yeah. By the way, by the way, uh, I'm yeah. a troglodyte because I was using the internet in the early 80s. Yeah, me too. To, yeah. to BitNet, to be in touch with yep. the NIH. Yep, yep. We might have been friends on BitNet, Mel. It's possible. <laughs> I was on there. Yeah, but the difference between you and, 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 and a troglodyte like me is that I never saw it coming. I had one of the first websites in the world. I never saw it coming. Yeah, well, I you know, that's... saw it coming, Pablos. No, but none of us saw this coming. It's very difficult to extrapolate to this extent. But the, but I think- go, the, back, go back now to Wikipedia. I, I okay, so here's what I want to say. You know, um, you're lucky you don't live in the United States of America because we've been trying to dismantle it here. But you could see what's happened in the, in the US like with our election cycle. I'm not talking about politics. But with the election, what you see is people get really caught up in it. And I would start asking people, well, you know, about how much time do you spend paying attention to the election? You know, well, about a year before the election, you got to start paying attention because the primaries are coming up and you got to figure out, you know, who's the dumbest asshole in the election and tweet about them. And so, you know, but if you take an average American, They'll all admit to at least an hour or two a week of following the election. For me, it's an hour or two a week, and I'm actively trying to avoid it. So this is a very conservative estimate. I think it's okay, more like fine. an hour or two a day. But it's we can true, but, but we're going to go with a super conservative number. All right. say, say it's 50 hours a year you spend on an election, OK? How many voting age Americans? 300 million? Okay. What's 300 million times 50? It's, uh, it's early morning here in Israel, Pablo. So once I'll get my, uh, I'll get my commander in chief. Let's call it, it's, it's 15 billion. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'll, I'll believe you. Uh, I think. Okay. So, how many hours, so 15 billion man hours conservatively spent spectating an election, right? I'm not counting the hours spent actually having an effect. I'm just counting the hours spent spectating. 15 billion hours. Okay, now go back. How many hours to make Wikipedia? How many man hours? They kept track, right? You're going to tell me now. I'm not going to tell you. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Yeah, but I'm talking to you now. <laughs> I don't know. Probably not more than 100 million. Probably not even close to 100 million. It's probably tens of millions at the most of man hours spent making Wikipedia. Right? We'll Google it. All no, right. No, we can Google it later. We can Google it later. Your audience can Google it. They don't have to yeah, talk on this video they call. Tell, they can tell us. Why should we waste So the point I'm trying to make is, I think, you know, you and I were raised in a world where personal responsibility was paramount. And I think that we don't see that in the conversation around technology and its effects on us, right? Everybody's looking for somebody to blame. And you know what? You still have a choice. You can throw that thing in the dead sea if, that's, if it's not making your life better. Or I can't. I can't. It'll float in the dead sea. <laughs> I'll, I'll throw it in the Mediterranean. Okay. 
you can do it. And uh, oh, it's not the Dead Sea, it's the Sea of Galilee is where we were at Kinternet. But anyway, yeah. the point being, you could throw it in any sea you want. Yeah. And the Sea of Galilee could, is not good because that's the water we drink. Yeah, we don't or you we could learn. Apple polluted water, yeah. Oh, I didn't know that, yeah. That's our drinking water. Oh, I, that's good, you guys still have some. So next time, you, a... next time you're there, you know, be careful what you do in the, in the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> we, we drink it for breakfast, you know. Okay, good to know. <laughs> I'll bring my own water, thanks. Exactly. There's, I, so I think there's like, a, you know, there's a, a, a process of developing an immunity, right? Like sugar. You overdo it as a kid, you learn how much is too much. By the time you're in your 20s, you probably have figured out how to not overdo it. You can have some sugar, but not too much. Alcohol, same thing. Cigarettes, same thing. Smoke and crack, same thing. Everything that you can overdo, it's up to humans to learn for us to, you know, it's up to us to teach our kids. It's up to our communities to try and help us build an immunity to the things that are bad for you. And we're at the beginning of learning to build those immunities with a lot of the technologies that people are currently complaining about, right, as a society. And I have a lot of experience, as do you, because, you know, I got addicted to email in the 80s, <laughs> right? So I learned, you know, early on, I mean, if, if you saw me in the, in the, even in the mid to late 90s, I would check my email, go out to lunch, come home, check my email, go out to dinner, come home, check my email, go out to the movies, come home, check my email, go to bed. I had the computer mounted next to the bed because I was a junkie for email. There wasn't anything happening, but I was addicted to this idea that like something might happen. You know, I was connected to half of my life was online at that time and, and I was addicted to it. And so I had to learn to get that under control. Now, emails come and go, instant messages come and go. I'm blissfully doing whatever I want. Right, because I learned to have immunity. I learned how much is useful and adding to my life and how much is too much and de deteriorating my life. And I think that that's a way that we need to frame that conversation. Papa, when, you're, when you're sleeping, wh where is your phone? No, my phone is right by my bed, but it's in, in a do not disturb mode. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't get, I don't get very far from this thing ever, <laughs> right? I mean, I would say the, the times that this thing is more than, more than a, I don't know, like arm's length away in my life is probably not more than a 15 minutes a day on average. It lives in my pocket. It's there. I, um, I don't think it even rings anymore. Like it, I don't, I don't even know. I don't hear bleeps. You remember the doo -doo 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 that we had back in the nineties? Yeah. Every it was just everywhere you went, you were surrounded by that sound. Um, I don't even have a ringtone. I don't even think. I don't even know what it is. Like it, my phone doesn't ring. It buzzes occasionally. I look at it often enough that I can see what's happening if I need to. I don't think I have a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but, but, so, you know, addicted people will, will never tell you that they have a problem, but I want to now go back to, to your youth. So, um, so you have this computer, uh, yeah. and, and, um, when did you learn to become a professional salsa dancer and did you go to <laughs> university? Keep going, um, man. Yeah. So I, so the progression was, you know, with an Apple two, there's, like the spreadsheet hadn't been invented yet. So I had to learn everything. It wasn't useful. There wasn't even, I mean, there were barely games for it, you know? So you had to learn. Shuffle Puck learn Cafe, the... my favorite. What? What was, was it? Shuffle Puck Cafe. I don't know that one. Oh. That was an Apple II game? I, I, I don't know whether it was Apple II, uh, oh. but that was one oh. of the first uh, Apple games that I played. Oh, wow. I don't like remember you that one. Shuffle Puck with your mouse. No, I had Sammy oh, Lightfoot and Load Runner, but okay. those were those were years in. That was after uh, years of breakout, <laughs> um, and then Ultima, Ultima One, Ultima Two, Ultima Three, and I had to learn how the computer worked by essentially by reverse engineering six five zero two assembly language, the machine language for the 
which is very obtuse. And so you really learn what all the ones and zeros are doing. But you know, it was basically a one kilohertz computer. So you could kind of watch the computation in real time, practically. It was so slow. Like third graders are faster at math than Apple II. So I learned a lot the hard way and I just was so interested that I built on that. And I think that was the what characterized maybe my progression is that just that I I you know got a head start and I stayed at it for so long it's hard for anyone to catch up to me. You could have a I mean, I routinely have hired people with PhDs in computer science and they don't know. <laughs> they don't know how computers work. And you know, not all of them, but you know, that's a uh, I think at the time when I got out of high school, companies would pay me to buy the newest computers and and try to make them useful. And uh, universities, most of them didn't know, I mean, they didn't have new computers of any computers. And so I couldn't learn much from them. I mean, probably there were a few where I could have learned something, but I didn't go to college. And then I, um, you know, I, I think I just kept at it and I just always had to learn the new stuff. And I've been learning the new stuff all the time and connecting it to my long history. So now I know a lot, it's hard to keep up. But so that's, uh, at the same time, they're also specialists in a lot of things that you can do with computers that that are way ahead of me, right? So um, of all the uh, crazy concoctions and and uh, and things that you've invented and worked on, uh, what right. are you what are you most proud of? Oh wow, um, the I honestly, you know, the thing I'm most proud of is that at when I was at Intellectual Ventures, uh, which I, I left last year, but you know we built the lab at Intellectual Ventures starting in 2007. And um, what we did is tried to figure out a way of investing in invention and trying to fund and support inventors. And it really opened my eyes to how poorly supported inventors are everywhere. Um, and I was fortunate to be on a team of, of about 150 inventors that we, um, that we rounded up at Intellectual Ventures in order to invent new technology. And we were very prolific. Um, you know, we came up with about five or 6,000 inventions of our own. Um, and the, but the process that we used kind of turned invention into a team sport and um, you know, made us able to go after a lot of problems, some of the biggest problems in the world. It's much different than what's happening in other contexts. Even if you're inventing, you know, if you're at like Hewlett Packard or something, you might invent a faster, cheaper inkjet printer, but you're probably not gonna invent whatever comes after inkjet. You know, that's the kind of thing that we could work on because we were, focused on invention, not on commercialization. And, and so we called, that pro, we called that invention capital. And it sounds crazy to a lot of people, but venture capital sounded crazy early on too. You know? And that's kind of worked out as a way of creating a market and, and funding a certain part of the life cycle of a new technology, but it doesn't fund invention. You know, we have, we have, scientific research and there's a little bit of funding for that and then you've got um you know entrepreneurs over here who are figuring out how to commercialize technology but the part in the middle that's inventors that's the job of taking the output of scientific research and asking yourself you know does this change anything humans have ever done can we do it faster can we do it cheaper better in a more humane fashion those are, that's what inventors do. And it's not until there is an invention that an entrepreneur can take that and get venture capital and make a business. And so um, I, I really am proud of having been a part of developing that process and, um, and getting to prove that it works. And in the long run, I'm convinced that, you know, this will this will catch on right now, unfortunately it, it hasn't. And we ha even, even with our success, we haven't 
there aren't copycats yet. <laughs> um, but, you know, it took a while for venture capital too. So hopefully, you know, in another 20 years when we do this call again, we'll be able to show that the world has a invention capital market and there's, and there's a, a support for invention and there's more of it. Because if what you see in the tech industry now is Silicon Valley has really lost its way. Um, what we call tech is really just software almost all the time. There's, and, and if you're looking at what, what gets funded, it's almost entirely you know, iPhone apps and enterprise software. It's not, it's not new technology. And there's, and there's so much amazing new technology we can build and so many problems we can have an effect on. And, uh, most, and it gets very little attention. And the, and the people working on those things get very little support. So I'm hoping okay, that the world but, but, can Carlos, part of Part of the problem yeah. is that yeah. uh, patents are only protected for between 17 and 20 years. And well, uh, sometimes it takes, um, yeah. you know, Yossi Vardy makes fun of me because the only real invention I had that became a, a success commercially took yeah. over, over 30 years yeah. to, re to reach Colgate and the United States. Yeah. Um, usually patents are long gone by that time. Yeah. Yeah. That is a problem. Um, there's, there's a variety of problems that we, you know, we could talk about related to patents and intellectual property. We'll talk about and, that. Next time. Uh, yeah. Give me one invention yeah. of yours. Right. You're proud of. Well, the one, uh, <laughs> um, the one that people like, to hear about that I think that I'm proud of um, is back in about, so in the, in the, I don't know, 12, 13, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, I started working on, I had at the lab, you got a picture of this. I have, you know, it's a very unusual lab because we had, we were an invention lab. So we had electronics labs, laser labs, uh, biology labs, um, chemistry lab, food lab, uh, machine shop, um, you know, like electronics labs. We had a little of everything and we were all on the same team. So in, in, a, in, in any other environment, those would be completely, you know, even if you had those things or two of them, you would, there would be separate departments competing for resources or something that wouldn't be together, but I can use all those things. And so one of our big projects, um, was we had a team working on the science of cooking and they were you know um they were largely trying to um document explain at a molecular level what's going on when you're cooking uh, we had chefs from the best restaurants in the world food scientists chemists on that team but it was right next to the machine shop actually it was basically in the machine shop and in the machine shop, I had, you know, every kind of tool for making stuff, but we had 3D printers. So I thought, well, what if we could make the 3D printer print some food? And um, what was interesting is that team is actually quite famous now. They're called Modernist Cuisine, and they developed, uh, they're famous for making the world's largest cookbook on the science of cooking. Um, called modernist cuisine. So what I did, I called it postmodernist cuisine, and um, <laughs> and I started trying to adapt 3D printers to print food and invent different technologies you could use to do that. And it sounded so crazy that even uh, even the modernist cuisine team thought it thought it was crazy. Um, but I did manage to get some of them to help me out, and I think I made probably about 70 patents in in printing food. Um, and so, and, but it was, so, you know, some of those are 10 years old now. Um, the first time I talked about it publicly was in, I think it was 2010. Um, I did a podcast with, uh, the Freakonomics guys with Stephen Dubner. And so it's 10 years old or 11 years old now, but it's, a it, you know, they, they do this amazing, um, the first part of the podcast is Nathan Mirvold, who I was working for. He's the one who did modernist cuisine and, and created intellectual ventures in the lab and everything. He's a true polymath. Nathan um, 
you know, is, is kind of heretical in the, in the food world. He's heretical in every world, but in the food world in particular. And so they had this episode where they interviewed Nathan and they interviewed Alice Waters. And Alice Waters is sort of the champion of the slow food movement. And this very, she has this very dreamy voice and a very romantic perspective on food. And she talks about going to the market and meeting the fishermen and getting the fresh catch of the day and then roasting it over an open fire, this kind of stuff. And then they cut to Nathan. And then we take it and dunk it in a tank of liquid nitrogen and hit it with a blowtorch. And, you know, and it's just this complete contrast. It's very entertaining what the, you know, the way the Freakonomics guys put it together. But then at the end of it, they say, and if you think that sounds crazy, wait till you meet this Pablo's guy. And then there's a, a story I, I, about me use, you know, trying to print food. And at the time, it just sounded so crazy. Everyone, everyone, everyone thought it was crazy. But I got to live through as people heard about 3D printing and worked on those things and got more familiar with it. And every year it sounded a little a bit less crazy. And now there's companies trying to make 3D food printers. You know, that's a product that exists. I mean, it's not very advanced yet, but, you know, still a long way to go. But anyway. Um, yeah, but I mean, both of, both of us know that these processes. Yeah, they take the a long time. To the supermarket, yeah. they can take absolutely decades. right decades. Yeah. yes uh, and that is a huge problem for inventors you know um i um yeah so uh, before we go uh i have two more questions uh yeah. you, just a few sentences about your professional dancing career <laughs> so it's probably unreasonable to call it professional but um in the 90s i had gotten obsessed with uh training in aikido this Japanese martial art. And it's unique among martial arts in a way because you don't do any of this punching and kicking in the air type stuff. You always train with a partner and the partner is gonna attack you and then your job is to gently communicate to them physically without words that you would like them to shove their head into the ground or something to that effect, right? And what I loved about it was this physical communication, you know, this ability for two people to like, in a, in a dynamic way, communicate that way. And it had nothing to do with self-defense for me or any of that. Um, and then one night I had been training in Aikido for about a decade and I was out at dinner at an Argentinian restaurant. And these dancers showed up and started dancing in between the tables. They were dancing tango. And I could see it that it wasn't choreographed and that the lead, the man was leading her around between the tables up on the bar, all over, it was incredible. They were pros direct from Argentina and, it, and the communication was incredibly subtle. I couldn't, and I realized at that moment they were better at the physical communication than I was and that the, the keto practitioners were in a way. And I realized that I wanted to learn that. So I tracked them down and made them try to teach me tango, which turned out it took advantage of none of my natural talents. Um, and uh, it was very structured and disciplined and I was not good at it. And, uh, and so I immediately defected to salsa. And it turns out with salsa, you can get away with a lot more freestyle. And, um, and so I never looked back. And instead of training with sweaty old Japanese guys, <laughs> sweaty young Latin girls. So um, it's an upgrade, I have to say. And I feel like I'm doing the same thing. I'm still, you know, the, the things I learned from Aikido are what are in my head. I feel like I'm still doing Aikido, but, I'm, but even some of the techniques are the same. It's amazing. Um, so in salsa, you get a new partner every song and you just see what you can create together. It's not choreographed. Um, you can do it in any place in the world almost. There's, you don't need to know the language. Just show up and dance. Um, Israelis have amazing salsa dancers. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful place to come visit for me. Yeah. Uh, and it's a country that loves you very much, Pablos. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I, 
I feel like, you know, you, you know, I think the reason my impression is, I think Israelis like me because I kind of legitimize their sensibilities for them. You know, they're all kind of crazy. They're all pushing the envelope. They're all living like it might be the last day ever. And to have a, an American come who, you know, is like uh, almost as crazy as them, I think, I think made them feel at home and make them feel comfortable. And so I think that's why they sort of adopted me. Papa, and, don't underestimate your abilities. You are just as crazy <laughs> as we are. And I think even maybe a no, little bit, a little bit when more. When I'm in Israel, Yossi got me to, to be like an advisor for some startups. And, you know, I realized after doing it for a little while, I mean, I loved it. It was so dynamic, but I realized I'll be in a room with a dozen Israelis doing a tech startup. And I realized after a while, like I had to be the voice of reason. Like I had to be the one to say, okay, guys, let's bring this down to be a little more practical. And I want to, I want to be the crazy one everywhere else in the world. I'm the crazy one. I'm like, you guys, this is too lame, too boring, too conservative. Let's take it up a notch. In Israel, I got to be the one to say, okay, that's a nice try, but a little too crazy, too wild, bring it down, let's make it work. So it, it's not actually that rewarding for me, <laughs> so I don't do it anymore. But I look, I think, I mean, I'm so impressed. It's, Tel Aviv is my favorite city on earth, no question. So I uh, cannot wait to come back. It's been too long. Pablo, it's, it's, it's great seeing you. This is a, like... Um, we used to say on the Kellogg's cornflakes, a reasonable facsimile. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah. it, 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 the, the, the good thing about Zoom is I know that you're, and I can't reach out and give you a hug, uh, but um, I'm giving you a virtual one. And, and, and it's, you know, in this time when we can't bring you to Tel Aviv, it's, you know, yeah. it's, it's what we got and it's a hell of a lot better than nothing. Yeah, uh, that's right. We have one, uh, one final tradition and, uh -oh. and even, even, um, Inventors and innovators have traditions. We so, would probably need more is the truth. That's one thing that's been amazing about getting to know folks in Israel and especially just the whole Jewish vibe. Like you guys are really good at maintaining these, these traditions that embody a lot of what humans need. And um, I think a lot of folks could learn from that. So um, that's very kind of you. Um, I, I'm uh, I'm um, I'm infatuated with the Beatles. Oh, okay. Uh, so um, and I know that you probably like the Beatles. Oh yeah, who doesn't? Okay, so I uh, know somebody who doesn't, but yeah. so th this is a, this is a um, a difficult question. What would be your your um, favorite Beatles song? Lucy in disguise with diamonds. Lucy in disguise with diamonds. Okay, this is you're, you're like you're raising a very high uh, high bar now because I'm going to ask you to sing a bit of that. Uh, you know that's not my department. I'm not going to sing. <laughs> of course you are. Uh oh, I'm going to hit mute and then I'll sing. Okay, go ahead. There, amazing, right? It, it was it was incredible. I mean, I, there there wasn't a single note that wasn't spot on. <laughs> Thank you. Pablos, this has been uh, incredible. Uh, so good seeing you. And, uh, and be sure to share this with all of our, uh, yeah. all, of our, all of our community. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I gotta say, I mean, um, it, feels, it feels like a really amazing community. I got a lot out of being, um, drug around the world by Yossi and being thrown in the mix with with all the crazy Israelis and I, I couldn't be more more happy about it and I feel like I uh, always try to pay that forward because I have not been able to pay Yossi back so well the only way to pay Yossi back is to is to thank him yeah uh, because uh, that's all you can do with so much yeah. Uh, um, yeah. very, been very generous with me uh, yeah so um I, before we go, I just want to share with you what my what my daughter mm. said to to um, the family the first time I came back from Kinernet. She said, "Well, here's this thing, you know. 
dad has two families. He has us and he has mm -hmm. a Canadian family. And once a year, a spaceship lands near the Sea of Galilee and 200 weirdos just like dad get off the spaceship <laughs> and they have this family reunion. We have to understand that. Yeah, yeah, yeah there you go. All right. Well, so, not so to make I, anyone else feel left out. They, they as, can as, a, as a member of the alien spaceship, uh, it was great uh, beaming yeah. you, beaming you up today, and uh, get, get a little bit of sleep. And uh, we love you, Pablo Solman. Thanks so much for being on. You've got Mel. Oh, Mel! Wait, 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 wait! I have a. I have to pimp my podcast. We'll have to do another one. Yeah, come. Yeah, come. I'm going to come to Israel and get all you guys on my podcast. It's called yeah, Jetpack for the Mind. So, so some actually some folks from Kindernet are already on it. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to be your guest, but today yeah, you were mine. Yeah, that's right. I was hoping to interview you and it didn't go very well. So I think you won this round, but next time I'm gonna get to the bottom of, of what it's like to spend 30 years on bad breath. <laughs> no, getting to the bottom, that would make me a proctologist. Oh, 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 you. Wow, we don't someone, go someone got there before me. I'm not going to contribute anything to the lexicon of, of, uh, <laughs> of humor on that, in that domain. Okay. Okay. Thank Papa, you, Mel. Take care, my friend. Bye. Bye. -bye. Yeah.